This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Friday, October 30th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of coronavirus, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Residents in the Ivory Coast capital of Abidjan are stocking up on provisions and sending relatives to distant rural villages ahead of a contentious presidential vote on Saturday that some fear could lead to violence. David Doyle has this election preview. But Abidjan's bus station in Isbabi is getting out of town. With the elections approaching, we don't know what is going to happen, so we're scared. We decided to get out. She's not the only one. Residents in Ivory Coast's capital are stocking up on provisions and sending relatives to hinterland villages ahead of Saturday's contentious presidential election. They remember the brief post-electoral conflict of a decade ago that took more than 3,000 lives. And in recent weeks, they've seen violence flaring on the streets. Many Ivorians had hoped 2020 would bring an end to a cycle of electoral bloodshed via a peaceful transfer of power from President Alassane Ouattara. But when his chosen successor unexpectedly died, Ouattara announced he would stand for a third term that the opposition says is unconstitutional. They've urged voters to block Ouattara's third term by any legal means and have called for civil disobedience and a boycott. We don't want a third man's eight. Three is too much. Alassane, free up the country. We want peace in Ivory Coast. Ouattara has responded that his opponents are not man enough to face him at the ballot box. Since his decision to stand, nearly 30 people have died in protests and clashes between rival supporters. His two main challenges are veterans of the many crises Ivory Coast has faced since the 1990s. Former Prime Ministers Henri Conan Beatty and Pascal Afi Ngassan. That's prompted some, such as voter Fabrice Ack, to call for a fresh generation of leaders. But with his two main challenges blocking the poll, Watara's third term seems certain. What is less clear is just about everything else. Experts say they do not expect an all-out war as seen in 2010 and 2011, as there do not appear to be significant splits in the security forces this time. But they do warn of a potentially protracted standoff marked by protests, strikes and ethnic violence. That would make it difficult for Watara to govern, weigh on the economy of the world's top cocoa producer and put lives at risk. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. Ivory Coast's 2010 election balance killed 3,000 people and sent thousands more fleeing into Ghana. Now, many of those refugees fear the Ivorian election this Saturday could spark new unrest, as this and not reports from Ampian refugee camp near the border with Ivory Coast. Some 3,000 Ivorians live here at the Ampian refugee camp at the Ghana border. They fled violence after the 2010 election in Ivory Coast. Now they fear the worst will come from Saturday's election. This woman, who escaped the 2010 election violence, says new asylum seekers are arriving from Ivory Coast with tales of danger and violence. She asked to have her face blurred. They are telling me that the situation in Cote d'Ivoire is getting worse. It getting, killing is so much going on. So they have to find a way to, to, to leave Cote d'Ivoire to protect themselves. In 2010, violence broke out when then-President Laurent Bagbo refused to concede defeat to Alassane Ouattara. This year, President Ouattara is running for a controversial third term, prompting opposition parties to call for an election boycott and civil disobedience. 
Ghana officials say they are in the process of registering Ivorians who are fleeing ahead of the election, but the coronavirus is complicating matters. Well, we have noticed that a few people uh, have indicated that they want to come into Ghana. But as you know, the borders have, have been closed due to the pandemic. And so we don't have that flow, uh, uh, at least not yet. We, we, we're not seeing large numbers coming in. Father of five, Alan Yebe, says he wants to return home, but not until it's safe. Perfect. I miss my country. I lost my parents who were there. Since then, I haven't been to Ivory Coast. Actually, as I am talking, I don't know if my mother is still alive. So truly my country. I miss my country. If my country is free, I don't have any problem. I will go. For now, those here will be watching what happens this weekend and praying history does not repeat itself. Stacey Knott for VOA News and Payne Refugee Camp. As we've mentioned, Ivory Coast voters are heading to the polls Saturday to cast their ballots in an election where President Alassane Ouattara is running for a controversial third term. For more insight, poll, Africa 54's Lino Mudu spoke with Nyaka Lagoke, a political analyst, author, and founder of the Revival of Pan-Africanism Forum. Contrary to many constitutional changes in Africa, where leaders change the constitution that allow them to run, our new constitution in, in, in Ivory Coast does not allow him to run. So, uh, if the prime minister uh, is that, uh, if the prime, the prime minister died, uh, Mr. Watra should have uh, stuck to his words when he said on March the 5th that he was not going to run for a third term. So, uh, his, his candidacy is not legitimate. It is not legal, and then morally and politically, uh, you know, it is not sound. When the new constitution was being voted, given past experiences, shouldn't the debate about a fair election have started much earlier as well by creating what would have been deemed a proper setting by all parties? For the last two two years, the opposition leaders have tried, you know, to ask Mr. Watara to create the condition for a transparent election in Ivory Coast, which could be inclusive. Even the ECOWAS in the United Nations, all of them have said that the election is supposed to be inclusive, which means that so far the process was not or is not inclusive. Cote d'Ivoire has had a pattern of crisis around the transition of power since the 90s, really. Is this a latest crisis only related to the president's decision to run for third term, or is there a deeper issue that is yet to be resolved? I can see that uh, the political elite is not always thinking about the interests of the nation. And then when one is in power, he wants to do everything possible to remain in power and then to defend the interests of his constituencies, be ethnic or political. I think this is how I can summarize uh, the root cause of that pattern. The opposition has said uh, several times, and up until now, we are just one or two days uh, from the elections, they continue to say that elections will not be held on October 31st. What are they basing this certitude on? Uh, among, like in the list of people who are supposed to run, there were Mr. Ouattara, another leader, and the former President Bédié, and the former, Babu's former Prime Minister, Afingé So those two decided that they were not going to be, a, be part of the process because the electoral process is not inclusive, and then it is not fair, and it is not transparent. And now they have called the militants or the supporters uh, to uh, undertake a civil disobedience. And then, so this is what they've been doing for the last two weeks. And then, Mr. Watara, the people have been taken to the, to the streets in different parts of the, of the country. And so they believe that uh, there will be many more Ivorians in the street uh, to prevent the organization of the election on October the, the 31st. ECOWAS has called on uh, opponents to reconsider their call to civil disobedience. Uh, people have some legitimate uh, requests. Uh, because uh, Mr. Watara changed the rules of the game, like in the, in the, in the, in the electoral process. And then quickly, the, during the quarantine, due to COVID-19, Mr. Watara uh, decided uh, to change or uh, to increase uh, the deposit to be paid by any person who, who wants to run for president uh, from uh, $40,000 uh, to $200,000. Uh, and, and, and then the second thing that he decided to do is that 
uh, people need to have an endorsement one percent of the of the of the voters in each of the 17 region we did, it was not happening like that since 1960 so and then the third thing that he did uh recently uh, it is decided to 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 reduce the number of the electoral bureaus uh, from to 22,000 from 22,000 to 10,000 and there is a strong fear that after the vote the situation will deteriorate further what are the possible short term solutions to prevent electoral violence and prevent this cycle to continue in the future if the people's power movement is successful uh, uh, the ivorian people uh, irrespective of their background uh, need to come together and then uh, chart uh, a new framework for a a, a reconciled Ivory Coast that is supposed to lead up its mission. So, you know, this is what we can hope for the country. Thank you so much, Mr. Nyakala Koge, for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. Vote counting continues Friday in Tanzania's presidential election. Early results indicate the ruling Chama Chama Pinduzi party may be headed for a near clean sweep. The National Electoral Commission has declared CCM presidential candidate Hussein Mwenye, winner of the Autonomous Island of Zanzibar presidential contest. There are unconfirmed reports from Thursday that opposition ACT was a Lendo party presidential candidate for Zanzibar, Maalim Saif Sharif Hamad, has been arrested. Some high-profile parliamentary candidates for the main opposition Chadema party, including national chairperson Freeman Boy, have lost their seats. Chadema presidential candidate for mainland Tanzania, Tundu Lisu, is rejecting the results, citing an unprecedented level of fraud. We'll be right back. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on BOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. In the last of our videos about the November 3rd U.S. election, here's a look at the people who've been president. Welcome to VOA Africa. Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States in an unbroken line of elected leaders stretched back to George Washington in 1789. This election season, we take a look at the men who have led the United States.
U.S. President Donald Trump promised to build a southern border wall when he campaigned four years ago, and he spoke about it again during the last presidential debate of 2020. Viewers Elizabeth Lee has this update on the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border. The Rio Grande River, the natural border between the U.S. and Mexico, has become an unofficial gateway for some and a battleground for others. We continue to see uh, narcotics attempting to come into the country as well as the smuggling of weapons and ammunition out of the country. These are criminal organizations that claim ownership of part of the territory uh, that they smuggle people or contraband through. In Laredo, Texas, manpower is a challenge in the more than 270 kilometers that make up this sector. We rely on kind of the balance of personnel, technology, and infrastructure. Prior to the Trump administration, there had been some infrastructure or physical barrier in place along some of the more than 3,000 kilometers that make up the southern border. Build a great During his bid for president, then-candidate Donald Trump promised to also build a wall at the border. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border. On Super Tuesday 2016, when voters picked their party candidate, Trump talked about how much wall he would build. We need a thousand miles, and we have all of the materials. We can do that so beautifully. As of the last presidential debate in 2020, Trump gave this update. We're over 400 miles of brand new wall. Customs and Border Protection Acting Commissioner Mark Morgan discussed the border wall the day after the debate. We're almost at 400 miles. We'll, I think we'll be there in a week or 10 days. And then again, by the end of this calendar year, uh, I'm confident we're going to be at the 450 mile mark. And then currently right now, uh, the, the president has uh, acquired funding, given us funding for a combined total of 730 miles. Morgan says the wall funding, some $15 billion, comes from multiple sources, including Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. $1.3 billion was authorized by Congress. The president's authority to use much of the money is currently being challenged in court and is awaiting a Supreme Court decision. He has no authority to spend money that Congress hasn't given him. Also in litigation, government lawsuits against landowners who refuse to give up their land for the wall. They and other opponents say a border wall is wasteful and ineffective. For now, construction continues. As seen in red, some of the new wall along the southern border replaces existing barriers, while the rest is being built where no barrier has existed, such as in Laredo. In addition to the new wall system, which comes with lighting, technology, and access roads, other technologies are also used. An example is the surveillance equipment that uses artificial intelligence. Democrats say they support more surveillance technology as an alternative to building more walls. But Morgan says tech agents plus a wall is the multi-layered approach needed to see results. Whether that's reduction of illegal immigration drastically drops, uh, the amount of drugs that are uh, uh, being uh, uh, um, driven through those areas, and actually uh, assaults on agents also are dropped as well. Just how many miles of new wall will be constructed may depend on the Supreme Court's decision and the outcome of the presidential election. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News. In part two of my report on the documentary, Could This Be the Last Ice? I continued my conversation with Scott Ressler, director and producer of the film, and he tells us about the shrinking sea ice, a cycle that has been going on for centuries. And really what the last ice, the film is about, is the sea ice. And the sea ice is the natural cycle. If you're looking at the top of the world, you see the white mass expand and shrink every year. And that's a cycle that's gone on for centuries and millennia. We're no higher than the polar bear. The polar bears on top of the food chain were just equivalent. Now, with the advancement of technology in the last decade or so, comes good and bad news. Connecting people around the world is key, and dumping of electronics in the oceans, lakes, and almost everywhere you go has had some effects. How, how do we deal with that? Then what happens when all those chemicals come up to the Arctic is the marine uh, mammals ingest them, and then Inuit communities who hunt for subsistence they, they ingest them as well. And there are high rates of toxicity in some of this wildlife. Um, there's, there have been high rates of uh, toxic chemicals in mother's breast milk uh, among Inuit populations. Yeah. Is it 
even possible to think that we can reverse the damage done. So one thing the film is highlighting is an area called the Piquiala Sorsuac. And as the sea ice melts toward this place, all of the wildlife is following it. Well, at the same time, uh, you have outside interests who are looking at this area that now has less ice th than before as, uh, you know, there's a lot of profit to be made. There are, uh, there's oil exploration and shipping routes and uh, industrial fishing. So one solution that the film is putting forward, which uh, is to support this Inuit-led um, uh, movement to protect the Pikialosaurus walk. And that is a, that's a movement that's, uh, Inuit both in Greenland and in Nunavut are putting forward together. And the onus is now on us as youth to revitalize that relationship that we have with our culture, language, traditions, and our environment. I looked at the uh, trailer for the pristine seas. <laughs> what is this project about? What do we need to learn from this? So Pristine Seas is really about finding some of the last wild places in the ocean. These are places that are still productive. They haven't necessarily been overfished or depleted. So the idea of Pristine Seas is to create marine protected areas. I want to take you back as a person behind the cameras. How was that for you? I think the thing that struck me first was the sense of community that I think has been fostered over generations. There's really a sense of all of your actions and your life are borrowed from your ancestors as well as your descendants. They need to make sure that any decisions being made in the Arctic today are going to ensure a better life for people 100 and 200 years from now. There is likely to be mixed reactions, Scott, after people watch the premiere of The Last Ice. What are your expectations, thinking broadly, even across the African continent? We're really focusing on these two young Inuit, one in Greenland, Alakatsiak Piri, and one in Nunavut, Canada, and that's Matali Oklik. They're worried about their future. They want a better life for their families. I'm hoping that people can see the human side of this issue. VOA Straight Talk Africa is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And Zoe Ludaki, the producer of the show, takes us on a brief journey down memory lane. All right, stand by. Here we go. In three, two, one. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. For 20 years, Shaka Sali has been hosting Straight Talk Africa. The first show aired on Wednesday, August 2nd, 2000, and since then, it has covered major developments and trends on the African continent, analyzing socioeconomic realities and ramifications in a balanced and objective way, while providing a platform for the audience to interact with newsmakers. Why should we believe what you are telling us? At the time it was created, many African countries depended international broadcasters for objective news. Straight Talk Africa skillfully filled that void. We talk about politics, health issues, elections. We talk about corruption. We had very large audiences in Nigeria, Ethiopia, and there was a need for a program sort of along the lines of call-in shows in European countries and the United States where people could ask questions, could get some context for what was in the news. The idea for Straight Talk Africa television program was groundbreaking at the time. Until then, VOIA African Division shows were broadcast on radio, but this show was going to be aired on television, simulcast on radio, and include telephone callers from the continent and the world. The host of the show, Shaka Sali, had been at VOA for a number of years, and had the reputation of being an excellent analyst of African issues. He insisted that he would not only interview newsmakers, but also give a voice to the voiceless. We attempt to discuss issues, for example, that reflect the interests of the people. I have contributed once to the show, and I was humbled 
when Shaka Hassan you know, called me back. In the 20 years Straight Talk Africa has been on air, it has produced over 1,000 shows and hosted over 100 guests per year. The program's topics range from politics and security to education, women's rights, environmental issues, civil society initiatives, to efforts to beat Ebola and COVID-19. I never take anything for granted. Each show is a new show as far as I'm concerned. We have nurtured this tree and developed a program that develops intellectual curiosity of the continent and demystifies the stereotypes about Africa. Straight Talk Africa often takes an in-depth look at initiatives of the diaspora to aid Africa and focuses on how chess and art can inform social change. Shaka Sali has interviewed many African leaders during his two decades helming the show, including former Liberian president Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was also the first elected female head of state in Africa, Kenneth Kaunda, the first president of Zambia, and Lazarus Chakwera, the current president of Malawi. And I look at myself as a servant of nothing but the truth, a servant of issues, not a servant of personalities, not a servant of ideology, not a servant of politics. Generations of Africans have grown up watching, listening, and interacting with Shaka and his guests. He provides a meaningful forum for the political truths taking place in their countries. Many fans talk about the Strait of Africa University that gives free lectures every week. When my dad used to tell us to watch your show, when he's back from work, he's going to ask us questions. That helps me to learn more stories of Africa and also to know other places as well. Strait of Africa is the nation viewing and listening. And after two decades, the program continues to leave an indelible impression on Africa's ever-changing political and social landscape while providing a blueprint for younger generations of aspiring journalists. I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Zoe Liudaki, VOA News, Washington. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.